Good morning. Today we get a letter from prison. It's Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. Of course, when we read these epistles, we do have to keep in mind that we're reading somebody else's mail. And Paul writes this letter to this congregation that he has spent um, a good amount of time with. He is writing from prison, and he sends this letter to encourage them in their own journey. And today we're going to be, I'm actually going to spend two Sundays in Philippians, and today's the first week. And I'm going to read Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to read eight verses and then skip down to verse 12 and 13 at the conclusion of this passage. If then there is any comfort in Christ, any consolation from love, any partnership in the Spirit, any tender affection and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped. But emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, assuming human likeness, and being found in appearance as a human, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Paul writes, Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work on your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to the will and to the work for his good pleasure. Now, when I was growing up, I remember I remember a lot of angst, a lot of time, a lot of worry spent wondering what I would be when I grow up. Isn't that a question we ask kids all the time? What are you going to be when you grow up? I um, Now, of course, I recognize what a privilege that was to be born in a time and place, a community, a family, an education system that actually encouraged and asked that question of their students, of all students, what do you want to be when you grow up? What a privilege that is to ask that question that so many in the world do not have. What do you want to be? It's a question we ask. I remember struggling to figure that out, worrying if I would figure that out. I couldn't even, I was a late decider even when I was going to go, where I was going to go to college because it was so hard for me to decide because I felt like to make that choice, I was choosing a path that would monumentally shape the whole rest of my life. So I struggled even late to make that decision. Where do you want to go? Who do you want to be? You know, a lot long ago, I was helping my dad clean out um, his garage, and he had a bunch of boxes that he said, okay, kids, it's time for you all to take this stuff, your childhood with you. It needs to go. And I was opening some box of a bunch of papers and notes that I had saved, and the very first thing I opened up was a list I had made for myself, probably in high school, pros and cons of different vocations. The very first one, well, I will mention this. First, to be the senior minister of First Christian Church Madisonville was not on the list at all. So the joke's on me. So there we go. But the uh, very first thing on the list, number one, veterinarian. And I had written, pros, I love animals. Cons, I hate science. And the truth is, not too long after that, that veterinarian dream would be sliced off the list totally because... um, I fainted and passed out at the vet clinic and woke up with the veterinarian tending to me and my looking up at my dog on the table who looked ashamed and embarrassed of me. (laughs) So um, that dream was gone really quickly. But the idea of who we were going to be, what do we want to do, what are we going to be when we grow up, of course, in Paul's letter to the church, as the early church is thinking about... um, God's calling, it was really and truly less about a vocational path and more about who you are. What are you going to do 
with your life, with your days, how you fill those days. Paul would want the people to know that God had a purpose for their life. We are called for God's purpose. That is a part of the letter to the church in Philippi, to understand that we are called for God's purpose, that there are things that God wants and hopes for our lives. And when they no longer had Jesus' physical presence with them, early Christians had to ask themselves, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? What does it mean to say, I am a Christian, that I follow Jesus? It's more, of course, than checking a box on a survey. It's more than a Facebook status update. It's more than even making it to church on Sunday on a cold winter day. As glad as I am that you have done that, to be a follower of Jesus is more than all these things. What are we called to be? Paul says, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself. And then he ends this passage by saying, My beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you. For God is at work in you. I read that line to myself this week, and I asked myself, where? Where is God at work throughout my life? Where is God at work in my life when the kids are out of school for the sixth day in a row? Where is God at work in my life when the pipes freeze, when the medical tests aren't good? Where is God at work in my life when the to-do list feels a mile long, when you can't sleep for the stress? Where? The thing I love about this letter to the church is that Paul keeps it simple. He doesn't give 25 steps, some big pie-in-the-sky plan. He doesn't even say, look, church, uh, if you're really a Christian, you'd be right here in prison with me right now or be out on the mission field. He essentially invites them to stop and look around right in the midst of their daily life and says, have compassion, be humble, don't go around thinking you're better than anybody else. Seek unity in this broken and fractured world. Serve others, not yourself. Love, have love and compassion. You know what that sounds like, of course. It sounds like Jesus. He goes on to remind them that is the very nature of Jesus, that he was loving, that he was compassionate, that he was humble and obedient, even to the point of death, Paul reminds them. You know, one of my favorite books is Tattoos on the Heart by Father Gregory Boyle. I've quoted him a million times, a priest out in L.A. But in this book, he said this phrase, That is one of those phrases that has just always stayed with me. Just a small change of words, but it stayed with me. He writes, Jesus was not a man for others. He was one with others. And there's a world of difference in that. He goes on to say, Jesus didn't seek the rights of lepers. He touched the leper even before he got around to curing him. He didn't champion the cause of the outcast. He was the outcast. He didn't fight for improved conditions for the prisoner. He simply said, I was in prison. He goes on to say, the strategy of Jesus is not centered in taking the right stand, but rather standing in the right place with the outcast and those relegated to the margins. He's right, isn't he? Emmanuel, God with us. God with us. That's who he was, is. You know, back in Tennessee, I was a board member of a food pantry that our church had been pivotal in starting. And it was a cooperative ministry in our small town amongst the shared churches, a very important ministry in the town. And I was always on the board, and one day I was going by the food pantry to um, stop and do something in the office there that day. 
And as soon as I came into the food pantry from the front door, a long time uh, volunteer there, actually was a member of my church, he sort of grabbed me by the elbow and stopped me. And he said, um, I am just, uh, he had just helped serve someone that he thought was perhaps maybe cheating the system. And he said, I am so tired of people freeloading off us. And I said, well, here's the thing. You don't, you don't know what somebody's situation is. And um, some people might try to cheat, but not everybody. And he said, yeah, 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 you're right. And he goes, but I tell you, if I put groceries in one more car that is nicer than my car, I am going to lose it. Now, the truth is, and I thought better to not say this to him, but I did think this. And the truth of that story is that just about everybody drove a nicer car than he did because nobody was cheaper than this guy on the face of the earth. And 20 years later, I'm sure he's still driving the same car. I feel confident of this. And I said, well, you know, here's the thing. We don't know their story. Um, they could have bought that car in a nicer, easier time in their life. That could be the nicest thing they have. That car could be borrowed. That friend could have driven him. We don't know their story. And we just have to keep that in mind. And he said, okay, yeah, I guess it. And he, he grumbled on. I just wish there weren't so many freeloaders in the world. And I finally went back to the office where I was trying to go in the first place. And um, I came across another volunteer, also a church member, and she had, was in the middle of taking a little boy back in the back to pick out his favorite kind of macaroni and cheese. And the boy had the macaroni and cheese, and now they were stopped at the desk while he was getting candy before she was sending him on back to his mom. And I'm sure, I'm sure the little boy heard that conversation. I'm sure his mom heard that conversation. I'm sure the volunteer heard that conversation. And as he was grabbing his little sucker and heading on back up front, this volunteer said to me, you know, every week I come here and I tell myself, God is sending me someone to love today. I tell myself that every time I come here, God is sending me someone to love today. Two really loyal, dedicated volunteers. But I tell you what. I sure know which volunteer I wish I could be. It reminds me of that line, that famous line that from Fred Craddock, who used to teach seminary, and he would say to his seminarians that we needed to remember to be sure, because when it comes to life, we can get an A in theology and still fail the test. Paul is less concerned with what you do and more about how you do it. Does your life look like Christ? Do people see Jesus in you? The hard thing, I think, the really tough thing, is that sometimes we have to continue to try to live out God's purpose for our life in the midst of all the million little daily, sometimes annoying details, the way life happens to us, how we choose to spend our precious days? Do we try to see the good in others, especially those annoying ones? Do I have compassion, compassion for my own self? Because sometimes the toughest critic in our lives is our own. Do I bring more unity to a broken and fractured world? Do I have humility? Which, of course, isn't thinking less of yourself, but simply thinking of yourself less. Do I serve? Do I lend a hand? Do I show up to do the heavy lifting? Do I have love? Love. As Paul reminds us, God is at work in you. God is at work in you. Let's pray. God, you have called us for a life of purpose to be your hands and feet in the world. And we confess to you that sometimes these hands of ours are clumsy, imperfect. 
prone to gripe even. But we trust that the God in Jesus Christ, who could not be contained by death, has been set loose in this world and can use even us, even our imperfect selves, to help heal divides, to love as you have first loved us. Use us, Lord, for your good purpose in the world. Amen.